Well, good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year from me up here. Let's pray. Lord, we bless you that you accompanied us through last year and that you beckon us into this coming year. We bless you, Lord, that you are with us and that you are good and that your love endures forever. So, Lord, as we come to your word, we pray that you'd open it to us and you'd give us something to hold on to as we step into this new adventure in 2023. Amen. Well, if you've got a Bible, please do uh, open it at Psalm 63. And I just want to make one main point, a couple of little points from this this evening. And uh, this psalm has been on my heart and in my mind for several weeks. And uh, when I found out I was to be speaking on New Year's Day, what a blessing, I thought I knew exactly what I wanted to share. And uh, I believe that this is a word for many of us for this year. And the theme of this message, the theme of the verse I want to underline is that we are to hold on to the one who holds on to us. Hold on to the one who holds on to us. And just have a quick look at verse 8 of Psalm 63. The psalmist says, My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me up or upholds me. Some of you will know that Taylor Swift wrote a song in 2017 called New Year's Day. And uh, the chorus line repeats over and over again, Hold on to the memories and they'll hold on to you. Hold on to the memories and they'll hold on to you. Hold on to the... And so on and so on. I'm sure it's good. I've never heard it. (laughs) But there's encouragement. I have studied it. There's encouragement in it to remember a particular party that the person she's singing to went to with them. And even though the party is over, they're to hang on to the memory of it. Nice. I think we can do better. Psalm 63, verse 8. My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me up. And as we begin 2023 with all its uncertainties and perhaps difficulties, there's certainly going to be opportunities and possibilities. I want to encourage you to hold on to something far more stable and reliable than some memories that you may have had of a party last year. Hold on and don't let go. Hold on and don't let go. That's actually a frequent motif in action movies and thrillers. I wonder if you've ever thought about that. Often there is a pivotal scene where the whole thing hangs in the balance or someone is hanging in the balance. They're hanging on by their fingertips about to fall into some abyss. There are hold-on scenes, pivotal scenes in Back to the Future. Listen out. And then I'll have a show of hands who's heard them all. Back to the Future, Empire Strikes Back, Die Hard, Tightrope, 2009 Star Trek, Vertical Limit, True Lives, Vertigo, Jurassic Park, Gravity Captain America. I've seen all of them except that one. Spider-Man 2, Lion King, Cliffhanger, Mission Impossible, and Lord of the Rings. Hands up if you've watched them all. I see a few hands. But in all of them, there is a crucial, pivotal moment where someone's hanging on for their dear life. And if they fall, it will all fall apart. And holding on is actually also a theme that's common in dreams. It voices the deep subconscious, an existential sense that we're hanging on by our fingertips. We fear falling into the void or the darkness or space or oblivion or death. And some of us may have felt like that this past year. And some of us may feel like that as we're entering this new year. That we're really just 
hanging on. Here in Psalm 63, we meet David, and he's a man on the run. Saul is breathing blue murder. Saul is threatening to kill him, and Saul is after him. And David is on his own, and David is on the run, and David is in the wilderness hiding, and he's left everything behind him, his wife, his job, his security, his home, his position. David is in hiding in the desert. But just look at his response. There's no sinking into self-pity. There's no breathing blue murderous threats against those who are after him. There's no blaming of his friends. Where are they? Why haven't they stood by him? There's no blaming of God who seems to be distant at this point. Here we have David in a kind of life or death moment, a crisis. It could have sent him into free fall. He could have let go of God. But instead, in this moment, he chooses to press further into God. He chooses to hold on more tightly. And David does use his memory. And he thinks about all the good times with God. He thinks about the past with God. He thinks about seeing God in the sanctuary and beholding his power and glory, enjoying his love, which is better than life. He calls these things to mind. He remembers who God is. He remembers how God is. He remembers what God has done here in this dark place, here in this desert place. He's bringing God into the moment. He's holding on to God. He's savoring those past moments and he's trusting God for the future. And I don't know what this coming year has for you. But I do know that the God who was there in the past is the God who will be with you in the future. That the God who is loving and faithful and good and powerful in the past is the God who is the same yesterday, today and forever and will be loving and faithful and good in the future. And rather than let go, I want to encourage you right at the start to hold on tighter. My soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me. Let's just pass those two things out. Firstly, David clings to God. The Hebrew word here is a good word. It's door back. And uh, the major Hebrew lexicon offers this for it in translation. To cling, to stick, to stay close, to cleave, to follow closely, and to join oneself to. All of that is in that word. And that's how it is with David and his God. Another lexicon, Gesenius, says it means to adhere specially firmly as if with glue. I didn't expect to see that in a technical theological tone. But to stick as with glue. And as I was writing this, I was thinking about Lionel Richie. In fact, I played him three times today. Stuck on you. That's what it is here. David is stuck on God. Thank you very much. It wasn't meant to be funny, but I appreciate that. He's stuck on God. He's holding on to him. He's sticking to him like glue. The word here, cling, my soul clings to you, first occurs in Genesis 2.24. And that's the first reference describing God's creation of marriage. And it says, for this reason, a man will leave his family and cleave to his wife. Leave and cleave. That's the word, cleave or cling. And it's almost a euphemism. And it represents intimacy and union and shared life together. My soul will cling to you. Moses led the people of Israel through the wilderness and to the edge of the promised land. And as he came to the end of his life, as he gives them the law and encourages them to live by the law of God, 
so that they can stay close to God as they enter into the land. He says this in Deuteronomy 10, 20. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and cling to him. Cleave to him. Hold on to him. Stick to him. Joshua, Moses' successor, who led the people of Israel into the promised land, at the end of his life, in his final speech to the people of Israel, encouraging them, he says, you are to cling to the Lord your God as you have until now. And I like what the prophet Jeremiah says in chapter 13, 11. He says, as a belt clings around the waist of a bloke, so Israel clings to God. We're to be Klingons. We're to cling to God. We're to cleave to him. We're to hold on to him. We're to be stuck to him. We're not to let him go. No matter what comes this year, no matter what this year brings to you, what possibilities, what difficulties, what wonderful opportunities enter into them clinging on to God. You know, I've got a keen interest, some of you know this, some would say it's a bit neurotic or an obsession in horology. And uh, last year or so on my uh, watch forum that I've been a member of for way too long, decades, Someone said, has the crisis of this year caused you to cling to your watches more? I mean, that's tragic. Even more tragic is a number of people commented saying, yes, yes, I really have. I've been clinging onto my watches as we've gone into a global pandemic. An idol is anything our heart clings to more than God. And this year, cling to him. Sometimes we cling to the past, or we cling to hurts that have been done to us, or we cling on to resentments or bitternesses, or we cling on to sins, or we can cling on to temptation. We're to be those who are marked by clinging on to God. And how? How do we cling? How do we Hold on to him. Well, you cannot cling from a distance. It implies intimacy, as I said. In Genesis 2.24, it's almost a euphemism for intimate union between a man and a woman. This is intimate. This is proximate. This is about being close to. You cannot hold Christ if you're clinging to something else. And how do we hold on to him? We hold on to him being with him. And how are we to be with him? We're to be with him in prayer. You know, I'm rubbish at prayer. I can fall asleep in any position praying. I can't, I've so often woken up praying in a strange position with dribble in my ear. I, I don't know how it got there, but prayer, just talking to God. Find a way that you can talk to God naturally and comfortably without falling asleep. Do it walking, the dog, or cycling, or running, or whatever it is you do, but talk to him. Cling on to God in prayer. Cling on to him with the Bible. I encourage you, if it's not part of your regular life and journey with God, get into the book and get the book into you. Start at the beginning. Start at the beginning of the New Testament if it's all new to you. Just start with Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And when you get to the end of it, go back to the beginning. Start again. Matthew, spend time with Jesus. Spend time with Jesus' people. Join one of our groups if you're not in one. If you've never actually met Jesus, come along to Alpha. You'll love it. Starting in a couple of weeks, of course, an introductory um, time together over eight weeks where we learn about Jesus and how to hold on to him. Hold on to him each time we have communion. Literally and physically, hold on to him as you're given the bread. Take it into you and cling to him. 
Go through your day with your favorite verse or your favorite thought about him, your favorite image of him or icon. Hold on to Jesus. Cling to him. Martin Luther often repeated, let us keep to Christ and cling to him and hang on to him so that no power can remove him. Don't let anything pull your hands away from clinging on to him this year. I've been reading a book over Christmas called Fear No Evil. Some of you will know it. It's a, it's a bit of a blast from the past. It's an autobiography by a man called David Watson, who was a wonderful church leader in the 70s and in the 80s. He often preached here in this church, particularly on Freshers' Sundays when term began. And it's an account of how he discovered he had cancer and he kept a diary of a journey with cancer, with God. And uh, the final paragraph of the book, I read it this morning, says this, I am not now clinging to physical life, but I am clinging to the Lord. Whatever this year brings, whatever this year brings, wonderful or terrible, the Lord is there. He is available to you. Cling on to him. My soul clings to the Lord. And then secondly, the Lord clings on to David. Verse 8 goes on to say, your right hand holds me up. David clings to God, the Hebrew door back. God clings to David, tall Mac. And note that he says it's your right hand that holds me up. It's not his big toe. It's his right arm, your right hand. And in Scripture, that is always a symbol. It's a metaphor that functions as the place of God's executive power. It's where God's power and divinity and majesty and might and decrees are focused through his right hand. It's where Jesus sits. I don't know if you watched The World's Strongest Man this week. <laughs> I always watch it. I absolutely love it. And Tiffany's picking me up after church to take me back for the last 40 minutes of it. <laughs> the final. But uh, in one of the heats this week, a complete legend, I've been watching him, it seems, all my life, the British Ghanaian Mark Felix. Uh, this week, he, he's actually called the King of the Grip. He's called King Grip in the... King, because he's got the largest hands in the world. Apparently a 13-inch span, and he's, he's got the strongest grip. He holds all sorts of world records for holding on to heavyweights for the longest period of time. He's a remarkable man. God's right hand holds you. That place of power that, against which there is no challenge there is no contest. There is nothing that can come near. There is nothing that can pull a little piggy back and loosen that grip one iota. That grip holds on to you. And if you've given your life to Jesus, if you've said yes to him, if you've asked him into your life, if you said yes to God, if you've said, I give in, I surrender, you get me, he takes you and he holds on to you and he promises that he will never leave you. He won't let you go. Jesus in the Gospel of John says, no one will snatch you out of my hand. Jesus is King Grip. No one will snatch you out of my hand. And he says, in the next verse, John 10, 29, no one can snatch you out of my Father's hand. It's not just one hand, but two hands holding us. It's King Jesus, and it's God the Father. They're both holding us. You think anything's going to prize those fingers apart to let you drop? He's got you if you've given yourself to him, and nothing is going to take you from him. I love what a theologian, Doug Campbell, says. He says, God is love, 
and love never lets go, and therefore God never lets go. God is love. Love never lets go, therefore God never lets go. We see that at the cross, where the loveliest life the world has ever known, those beautiful hands that uphold creation are nailed to a cross. And at any point he could have pulled himself away, summoned legions of angels, but instead he stays there. Love doesn't let go. Didn't let go of that cross when he paid for our sins and he won't let go of you this year because he loves you and he can't love you any more than he has done, does and always will. My favorite phrase in the marriage wedding vows is the line that's repeated, to have and to hold from this day forth, to have and to hold from this day forth. I think it's epic when each lover gives themselves to their beloved. It's actually an ancient medieval phrase that comes from the legal realm of land conveyancing when a piece of land was signed over to someone else. They'd get a bit of vellum and they'd write out the legal contract and then both would sign it, it would be stamped and handed. It was called habendum et tenendum, to have and to hold. There's a beautiful medieval depiction of Jesus at the cross where his body represents the parchment and a transaction of land of paradise being given to us. And he says that it's in his blood he writes to have and to hold. And Christ has legally contracted for you to have you, for you to have him, to hold on forever. And there's nothing going to make him let go. I need to finish. Towards the end of Lord of the Rings, Frodo and Sam have made it to Mount Doom where they're destroying the ring of power in the lake of fire. And uh, Frodo, you'll remember, is attacked by Gollum who seizes the ring and then in his sort of giddiness and glee he falls, stumbles backwards and falls down into the lake of fire where the ring is melted. But Frodo is knocked off the edge. And in that scene, Frodo is there hanging on by his fingertips. And there's a great drop below him. There's molten lava. He's holding on for dear life. The strength is going out of his arms. The hope is dissipating from him. And then suddenly there is Sam with tears of love in his eyes, he reaches down the strong gardener's forearm and he says, give me your hand, take my hand, don't let go, don't let go, reach. Frodo reaches and is brought up to safety. I don't know what this year holds for you. I hope it's just wonderful opportunities and possibilities for many it will be but knowing life often it's joined with difficulties and exigencies but whatever we face we don't face it alone we face it with the Lord cling to him my soul will cling to you and your right hand will uphold me Amen.